I am Jan Willem Nijman. I'm a game designer. I've worked on various games, most recently Disc Room, before that Minute, together with Kitty Kalis, Yukio Kalio, and Dominic Johan. And I'm also was one of the co-founders of Flambeer, uh, which was an indie studio that was around for the last 10 years that we recently shut. Minute is a little black and white adventure where you play as a character who finds a cursed sword which causes them to die every 60 seconds. It's a very short and focused and almost minimalist game. Just two colors, 60 seconds, uh, one button. And it was really a, a passion project just for people pouring their heart into a tiny little game. I am Mark Radosi. In January 2019, I released a game called Vision Soft Reset, which is a Metroidvania where you can see the future and use that to your advantage. Early on in the game, you get this vision that the world is going to blow up in 20 minutes. If you're exploring for a while and getting close to that 20 minute mark, you can rewind time several minutes to like a part where you saved and that would like create a branch in the timeline. I like to think of it as the entire world is a puzzle. Hi, my name is Charles Griffiths and I'm the design director at Cavalier Game Studios and we are the makers of the Sexy Brutal. Sexy Brutal is about you waking up in a British casino mansion called the Sex Brutal and you wake up in the middle of one of these mask balls as Lafcadio Boone, a priest, and you have to figure out what is happening because all around you it seems like the mask ball is going very wrong as people all over the house, guests and such like, seem to be being killed and so you're sort of working your way and trying to figure out what the hell's going on there and the final kicker to the whole situation is that you find that when it strikes midnight the day starts all over again with you waking up on the floor so you're trapped in this groundhog day loop We did really like time loop games. There sort of hadn't been that many, you know, Majora's Mask had been around and everybody loves it and it's got a, sort of got a real status to it, but weirdly everything had been sort of quiet on time loops for a good 15 years. There were other games that, that we really liked that sort of used the time loop thing, like um, Gregory Horror Show was definitely a big influence because that is a similar sort of creepy house scenario and eccentric guests. Or some, sort of, you know, continue to live in mild obscurity like a uh, tulip. Uh, immersive theatre was another huge inspiration because it's just all curiosity driven, you know, you're there, you're in a big crazy building in London and all these actors are doing multiple scenes all around you at the same time and you just wander around and you follow whoever you're interested in and, and Moon RPG Remix was, uh, was another one where it was like, well, although that had never been translated to English, it was just something where, for me, it was just a game that I'd read about and it was just so fascinating to read about. And I loved the idea of it, but it wasn't it wasn't translated and um, there was things that we liked there, but in a way that sort of didn't come till later because the Sex Brutal grew out of a different game or as is so often the case with development, it was more like it was narrowed down into Sex Brutal. Kitty and I were talking about Adventure Time, the cartoon originally, and that every episode was a completely different adventure and we really wanted to make a, a game that captured that feeling where you start somewhere and no matter what direction you head in there's one minute of adventure waiting for you like it could be a completely different little quest or story or puzzle and we wanted to pour that into game format create something where every screen has a secret you know there's there's always something interesting to find 
like, like a, almost like a condensed exploration game. No filler, just different interesting things packed into a small package. Our main design ethos is still we don't want to waste the player's time, you know, like time is precious. You could be experiencing other stuff. You could be enjoying amazing art or eating delicious food. So in a way, putting a time limit on a game where, okay, you can only play this for two hours is a very responsible way of creating games. You know, you're not overstaying your welcome as a creator. I had considered the design a lot from the beginning. One important thing was like where you started, like like the hub area, had to be in the center of the map or like really close to the center because everything is going to like start from there. So like they're going to have to be a bunch of paths starting from the center because you're always going to be coming back to the center. If people were playing this game and they had to redo a loop and it took them a long time to get to where they wanted, That'd be annoying, that'd just be, be like a waste of time. So if you think about it like geometrically, I want to minimize the largest distance between any two points on the map. And how that works is that like the map has to kind of look like a circle. There's some metroidvanias I see where like it's just long corridors from like the left to the right, and it's just like one big hallway like that. And like that design would have really killed the game in this case. The first thing that we were working on was something that was absolutely had, you know, elements to Sex Brutal and had this sense of routine and time loops and characters that had a little life and a little schedule that they followed. And the more we tinkered with it, the more we realized that the, the bit that we were most interested by, you know, the, the main bit was how we just we just loved watching characters do their loop and, and you just liked the fact that it was it was all the schedule Majora's Mask things that we liked of just, just seeing seeing that routine. So yeah, we started to sort of narrow it down more and more and what we we won't do, the every single thing is all happening at the same time. It's just one loop, it's just going to be one Groundhog Day and the very beginning of the game will be identical to the very end of the game. That's the purest version of the idea, but we can't do that because that would be far too complicated. That, you know, that would just be a nightmare. Everything, every, you know, every puzzle would be interconnected to every other puzzle and it would be, uh, you know, a complete house of cards. And if we wanted to change something, that would just be surely a nightmare. But then, you know, like a moth to a flame, it was, it, the thing about that version of the idea is that yes, it's the purest, it's the most interesting, it's, you know, it's terrifying, but it's great, you know? And, and originally we thought about having multiple days and we thought that and then over time just all of that fell away and it was just like nope one day the first puzzle the last puzzle it's all happening at the same time everything is effectively one giant choreography that's the game one minute is something that we kind of tried from the start because we knew there was going to be a lot of replaying and we didn't want frustration like one of the things uh, in games that can be really terrible is just putting all this effort into something and then right before the end you know you have to do it all over again the same thing and our whole point was to make a game where you're not doing the same thing over and over again even though it's a time loop game but where actually every minute feels like a completely new and different adventure so one minute seemed like kind of the perfect balance between you can do a whole lot in a minute, but also if you mess up, you have to do it over again. It's just a minute. There was another feature that kind of came from this that I also really liked. And that was like a really good way to do fast travel because in this game, you can fast travel from, you can do that from anywhere, which I really like. To me, that was like the best appeal of the Metroidvania genre was that it was tight, it was short and like it didn't, waste your time compared to other adventure games and in a lot of adventure games you have like this this big sprawling world and like that can be really fun and you get to like explore and do like all these different things but then there comes parts where you're like okay you need to talk to this one npc somewhere to advance the plot and you don't know where they are in a metroidvania you don't really have to do that the map is so condensed you just have a lot of stuff to uncover it's all really tightly packed I think when you are playing a game like Minute, there's a pretty ideal structure of, of how you play it, where first you explore and you learn of all these loose ends, things that you might investigate. Like, oh, there's a, a, a stairs there going down. There's these weird plants growing here. What can I do with that? Also, there's the crabs here. So you kind of create this internal map of the world. And then at some point you start to plan like, all right, what do I do with the crabs? Or you know, I'm gonna go, my next run, I'm gonna go down those stairs and see what's there. And 
and then you kind of execute your plans and as you gain more abilities your list of places to explore that you haven't seen yet grows but also you get a more precise idea of all right what's the things i'm gonna execute so it has this really nice loop of kind of explore plan execute that when it works well it's, it's really satisfying putting that time limit on exploration in a way also gives you very clear control of what a player is going to experience and what will be new and you kind of have this one minute radius around where you start you know and you can fill it and make it super detailed and dense and and if minute was a two minute game instead we would have had to make a, a vastly larger world it would have been a much harder task and it was really fun in a way that we created a game that is full of these little details to explore and secrets to find but also we tell you kind of hurry up you know you you're gonna die in 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 20 seconds 19 18 but also we're like hey and also stop and smell the flowers here and and that's something that really uh, relates to daily life in a way that you know you can be very stressed out and there's lots of stuff to do but there's always tomorrow and that's I think kind of the moral that comes out of it in a way that it's also a game that talks a bit about the pressures of, of work and, and how to deal with that and what kind of mindset you can take. It sounds very zen but it's told to you you know through funny NPCs and, and a kind of messed up world. It's, it's not something that we lay on really heavy but it is kind of interesting that you can take all these themes out of just mechanics as well. games are such huge complex things and if you want to make something that you are not really clear on what exactly it's going to be and something that will be big and also new it's very difficult and then you quickly run into you know pre-existing patterns and you have to also use design that was not specifically made for your game but that is based on other games and it, it just becomes this huge process of what is new what is where do we take risks in what we create Kitty previously worked on uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a huge game with hundreds of people working on it. And she also loved that, but she also told stories where it's like, just making decisions takes so much time and involves so many people. And if you work on something small and focused with restrictions, it is much easier to try something. Do we want to put this in the game? I don't know, but in two hours we can see it in the game and we can decide. It's a very cool way of working where you it just gives you more freedom as a team because you know what you're working on very clearly. You know kind of the boundaries of it. I mean, that was something that we took very seriously from our days making AAA games, which is, hey, look, you know, there's no need to start getting bogged down by your art pipeline or anything. You know, if you're just using placeholder stuff, you just use the grey box stuff, you got to have a little bit of imagination. And that's where, like, when you're making a bigger game or you need to pitch it or you need to do all that kind of stuff, that's what won't fly. You know, people don't want to, or it's a different skill to fill in those gaps. But it was something where it's, it's just so much more efficient if you can do that. So that was one thing that I'd say we got very, very right, was that, you know, the sex and retail was made uh, with extremely ugly, rudimentary assets. But, for example, the beginning of the game with Reginald Sixpence, the first puzzle, you know, that hardly changed. And, uh, you know, I mean down to the second, that hardly changed in years as we were developing it. The iteration had already been done, you know, it, it had been made, it had been timed, it had been play tested and everything. If you can set up the framework the way you want it, set up the tools, if you get all that stuff right uh, the first time, you know, you, you'll save yourself a hell of a lot of time um, later on. I think just as important as the time limit was just the art style that Kitty uh, decided on and, and Dom also helped with. It's just like, it's one bit pixel art. It, it's also black and white, it's low res, and it was, it, it, it's a similar 
restriction like we have on, on the gameplay in a way where it's just like everything needs to be clear and precise um, otherwise people are not going to understand what even is on the screen all of that together kind of informs what became Minen it's one of those things that's really hard to make in just like a day or something because uh, this mechanic doesn't really have any value unless you're going back like several minutes which means you basically have to have like some part of a game or like a few levels already made for this mechanic to make any sense. It was kind of a gamble, like you couldn't just like do this in a game jam or something you, to like test it out. You had to like just really go for it and just hope that it's going to work out in the end. When I finally actually implemented the mechanic that the game was based around several months into development and it actually worked, I was like, okay, that's that's cool. That was a good feeling. When all the puzzles are interlinked, you know, when, when, when the change that you make to Puzzle 2 seriously has knock-ons to what's happening in Puzzle 8, you really can't afford to, to just be like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, we made all this stuff already, all this stuff is done, all these effects are here, you know, you just can't do it, you just can't do it. You, you know, you've got to be iterating on the bit where it's fast and, and easy, and then only when you're going like, right, that's it, 2 is happening in this way, 8 is happening that way. Because the further you move down, obviously, just your ability to adapt is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. That was particularly important in this game, I think, where everything is so interrelated. We wanted to solve problems that we felt we'd seen before. So as much as we love Gregory Horror Show, Tulip, they're not easy games to play. Not at all. You know, and Tulip had to ship with an instruction guide basically telling you how to do every puzzle, you know, and I'm not surprised. You can be tempted to believe that, yes, you know, people are curious, I'm curious, I'm going to want to absorb all this, it's going to be great. You really need to be careful about overloading it. When you're looking at a story of a character in isolation, you know, that, that can feel like they have a good, full schedule and they're doing interesting things and they're always saying dialogue and they're always doing that kind of stuff. But you know, when you add that up with a whole bunch of other characters, and when you expose that to a new player, it's just absolutely overwhelming. And that's how, it, in fact, like we ended up structuring the game the way we did it, where we sort of, the bit where you're with Sixpence, you are actually effectively cut off, you know, that's, that's our version of a tutorial. We have to sort of cut you off in a little way and just give you a little slice of the Groundhog Day to absorb, with only, you know, one, two characters. Less is more, less is more, less is more, you know. Yes, we can have them say dialogue every moment, but then if we do that, people get a little bit, you know, like, ah, they get that sort of fear of missing out. You want it to be something that people can actually take in and feel like they're seeing all of it and feel that satisfaction. The tutorials went through a bunch of iterations, and I think it could actually be improved a lot. The tutorial for, like, actually introducing the time loop mechanic, I believe was handled pretty well. Like, first I wanted to make sure, like, you got the basic mechanics of the game down, but it had, there's no time loop stuff is even mentioned at the start of the game. And you get to the time loop when it's like, you come across this door that needs a password, and you don't know what it is, so you go on, and then you come across this room that has the password, but you can't physically actually get back to that door. So this forces you to understand, like, okay, now here's the time loop mechanic on how you get back to that spot, and you have to use it in order to get out of that trapped area that you're in, but now you know that code because you saw it earlier explicitly say in text, okay, we went back in time, but we saw the code because we saw into the future. This is the time loop mechanic. This is why it's useful. I, I will say, I think it's pretty important to have the player actually do the thing that they're being taught rather than just, you know, being told to actually do something yourself that will like really reinforce that. The pressure of time is like, really strong like a lot of people react to it very strongly as well and even personally like i am not a fan of time limits in games they they stress me out like nothing like even like some of the mario games you just have a timer to finish your level and it's always more than enough time but even for me that's like what if what if i what if i don't make it you know like i might as well just give up now it is a very strong feeling so 
Um, that is something that we try to communicate very clearly throughout Minute and in the design. Like, it is a game where you die every minute, and that's okay. You know, it's not stressful. It, it's not gonna hurt you. It's just a minute. Um, you, as a player, you kind of have to you have to deal with like killing your darlings in a way. Like, if you make a beautiful painting and it takes you weeks, and then you have to burn it, that's really terrible. But if you have to burn a scribble that you made in two seconds, that's totally fine, you know, for most people. And we just let you make loads of scribbles, and every scribble gives you a little bit of of progress. What can we do to again solve some of the problems that we felt? If it's too open, if it's all too ambiguous, it becomes very, very hard. So what we wanted to do was, hey, look, there is an advantage to what we're doing with time loops that other puzzle games don't have. When you get stuck on Monkey Island, say, or, you know, Thimbleweed Park or something like that, when you get stuck on those, you're just kind of stuck. You know, there's just not a lot anyone can do for you. It's even worse if the puzzle is waiting for you to make a kind of slightly lateral move in your thinking. That can be the, the, the worst of all because it's just uh, the designer, everybody is sort of looking for you to make a connection, have a certain epiphany. It's just sort of reach the end of the road where no, nobody can do anything else for you really beyond like give you a strong hint or just tell you what the answer is. And what I liked about what we were doing and the fact it was all choreographed was if somebody's a bit confused, a bit lost, like, okay, how do I do this next thing? I just don't see how I save this person. With the map, we were able to just give them more granularity, just a little bit more feedback of just going like, look, 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 okay, if you're a bit stuck, you could break it down and just go like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to pick this character and I'm just going to spend this day just following that character and just see if I've missed anything there. So they can start to telescope the problem down to smaller chunks and then when they do that we can we can give them something permanent from that it's not just their knowledge because then if they go away and don't play the game for a week or something they might come back and have lost that knowledge whereas just with the map we would just keep giving them something you're just being like you know you can always just keep contributing to that if you're doing nothing else you're continuing to fill out that map i was actually pretty worried that people wouldn't get it like get the time reversion stuff or like they would get it but they think it was annoying and i thought like okay if you got an ability in one of these branches then you rewound time to before you got that ability then you wouldn't have the ability anymore and i thought like okay people might think that's really annoying so i decided to like okay you keep the abilities but you don't keep like like health upgrades or something and like there'd be a bit of a trade-off between like time and, and health but you wouldn't like lose an ability you earn I didn't make anything like too complicated. Like you don't have to do like these really crazy combination of events to get anywhere to like progress. I just wanted to make sure that like people enjoyed actually playing the game. And to my relief, people actually liked it. Like not only did people like it, like people said like that was like the best part of the game. Everyone was like, okay. This this time reversion stuff like this was a neat idea like this this is fresh like this sets the game apart and I like want to experience it that was that was a really cool feeling that like that was like the main point of the game and people got it the time loop stuff is cool but I do think it needs more way more effort than people think to make it fun it just it just isn't fun out of the box you know having a complicated time loop kicking off around you. So these are all the things, stuff like, yeah, the map, the listening, all that kind of stuff, is these are the ways that we can make the time loop actually fun, actually enjoyable, actually accessible. When I look back on Vision Soft Reset, like, I think it had, like, a cool idea and some good stuff in it, but I think, like, there's a lot of things we, we could have done better. I saw that people, like, did really latch onto the time version mechanic and really liked it, so I think, like, I can be a bit more ballsy with the stuff that you would lose if you went to a different branch. Like, maybe, like, on one branch you get, like, this upgrade, and th on this branch you get another upgrade, and you have to, like, make a decision on which upgrade to get. I think I'd like expand more in like the optimization side of it. There's a puzzle where 
you have to get to this point on the map in a small window of time. And the way to solve the puzzle isn't to like be a super speedrunner pro, it's instead to like find a route through the world that like gets you there faster. The thing I was most proud of was that people got it and that like people understood what the game was trying to do and liked it because of that. Regardless of what people thought of different aspects of the game, like the, the core idea that the game was based around was fresh, was uh, executed fairly well, and like people thought like, hey, this is cool, this, like I understand what this is, and I like it, and it's pretty entertaining. So I was like, that was probably what made me most proud. I do feel like, we all feel like we did actually tick the boxes we set out to tick. We made all those sort of huge seismic cuts in terms of what the game was going to be early, but I don't feel like we had to sacrifice too many things where it was just like, oh my god, I can't believe we're cutting this, like this breaks my heart. And we didn't want the puzzles to sort of repeat either. I'd, I'd like to think that every puzzle scratches a slightly different time loop itch. It's just sort of ticking a few different things about whether it's sort of listening or whether it involves a double loop or whether it involves using a dumb weight or that kind of thing. You know, we just wanted one puzzle that would tick each different feeling and then not repeat. We did the things we wanted to do and we're happy with that. And then afterwards, you know, after us, it seems like then you know, I'm sort of glad we were sort of in when we were, you know, because now, like, yeah, there's been, there's been a bunch more time loop stuff. Some people are just doing the narrative side of it, um, which is, you know, literally just translating immersive theatre sort of into a video game. And other people are doing the, you know, sort of just doubling down on the, the exploration feel, like the Outer Worlds, yeah, you know, just going the opposite way of going like, yeah, let's give you all this space to explore, but then you've only got a limited time, so every time you'll sort of fire off in a different direction, and that's kind of interesting. And then Deathloop, I think Deathloop would be really interesting just because seeing it done at such a scale and with a AAA budget and a big team, like, that's going to be really interesting. Because like I say, I don't, I don't think everything about time loops is necessarily, you know, lends itself to being as entertaining as people think it might be. So it's going to be really interesting to see a AAA team deal with that, you know, because it, like at that level, you need to be selling a lot of copies, you need to be appealing for a lot of people. So I'll be very interested to see how they sh smooth off the uh, rough edges of, of what a time loop implies. You are seeing a lot of time loop games now and it feels like kind of a natural tie in to people not being so afraid of games that you start over right from the start again. Like roguelikes and, and similar games really opened the way for that and building these little worlds, I think it makes sense as a designer to want to explain the why, you know, like you're not just respawning, you're respawning because there's a, a, a machine there or whatever, you know, some games go there. Um, and the whole time loop thing, I think a lot of it comes from that, where it's like, why are you replaying the same thing again? It's really fun to see kind of the zeitgeist of game design or whatever shift over time, and now that's something people are noticing that has always been there, but it's a very good source of inspiration or a good uh, direction to work from. And just the time loop or resetting everything after set time is such a grand sweeping statement in a way that it can't help but inform almost everything else in your game.